I consider myself a student of corporate worship, meaning I just love to read things about corporate worship and see what people have said throughout history about corporate worship. And of course, I always want to compare that to the Bible. And I ran across something that I found very interesting in my perusing of the internet a couple days ago, and that is Wesley's Directions for Singing. These are, you might even, if you're a Methodist church, you might have these in your United Methodist hymnal. I'm not sure if they're still there or not. Maybe you can confirm or deny that. But they first appeared in 1761 in the publication Select Hymns, which was a hymn book for early Methodists. And so I want to read through these seven simple directions for singing. And these guided the Methodist church. I'm not a Methodist, but these guided the Methodist church for, they probably still guide them today. So these were the instructions of Wesley at the beginning of the Methodist hymnal. It says this, directions for singing, that this part of divine worship may be the more acceptable to God, as well as the more profitable to yourself and others. Be careful to observe the following directions. Now let's take a time out here for a second because we need to understand what Wesley's theology was, and that is Methodism, which basically means that he was trying to find methods for achieving holiness in the Christian life. And this is why you'll find a bunch of things written down, like we're about to see specifically with, with singing in congregational worship. He was trying to communicate a method that would be profitable, just like he talked about, that it may be more profitable to yourself and others. So he was like, these are the methods that we want to implement so that our divine worship, th this part of divine worship, which I love that phrase actually now that I think about it because it shows that singing is just a part of the worship service. Singing is simply a part of the divine worship of God. It is not the whole thing. There's the preaching, there's the giving, there's the baptism, communion, so on and so forth, prayer. All of it is a part of worshiping God and singing is just a part of it. But Wesley is focusing in, because this is a hymnal, on that one part of divine worship. And he says, be careful to observe the following directions. What are his directions? Number one, learn these tunes before you learn any others. Afterwards, learn as many as you please. Wesley is imploring the people who are using this hymnal to just learn the songs in the hymnals. And I think we kind of have to have some historical context for this. One of the things that we need to understand why he's saying this specifically, I think, is because Methodism was not just part of a singular church. It wasn't like its own denomination at the time. It was a movement that was in a bunch of different churches. And so he wanted when Methodists from different churches got together, he wanted them to be able to worship together, which I think reveals something that I talk about all the time. What do we do when we gather together and specifically singing to carry along the, the same lines that Wesley's talking about here? What are we trying to do? We're trying to sing together. Why does Wesley want people to learn songs from the Methodist hymnal? and not go beyond them. It's not, well, I mean, he says eventually you can go beyond them, but his primary concern is I want you to learn these, probably because they teach Methodist theology, but also because when you gather together with other Methodists from other churches, you can all worship together and edify one another and speak in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, admonishing one another. I want you to know these songs, not just for the sake of just knowing this collection of songs, although that's part of it, but so that when you gather together with other people, you can edify them with your singing. And nobody in the service has to sit on the sidelines like, I don't know the song, so I can't participate. Wesley wants you to participate in the singing portion of your service. And I think of what this means for us today, and I think of our churches. This is something that I've had to go through at my church because when I first showed up at my church, I had different song preferences than the people who were actually at my church. And this is true not just for my current church, but for other churches as well. We, we all have our own preferences, but what is the purpose of our corporate worship? It is that we would sing together. So we lay those preferences down. I would like to go outside of the certain song selection that I have at my church, perhaps. There are songs that I prefer to worship with, but I 
I don't implement them into my church, at least not right away. I might do them over time, but not right away because I want my people to be able to worship together. And so we have, in a sense, a repertoire of songs. This is also why we have a repertoire of songs of 30 to 40 songs right now, because I want our church to learn these songs first. And then once we learn these and we can sing them all together, teaching and admonishing one another in the act of corporate singing, then we can move on to the next song. But until my church learns the core songs that we're going to sing together, I don't want to move on to a new song, implementing a new song every single week. I want my church to be able to sing together. And I think that's partially what Wesley was getting at here. The second direction, sing them exactly as they are printed here, without altering or mending them at all. And if you have learned to sing them otherwise, unlearn it as soon as you can. Once again, it seems to me a note of being able to sing together harmoniously. And I've got to think of when I started doing more hymns at my church, I had learned like modern arrangements of hymns before. I mean, hymns haven't haven't died. They haven't gone away. There's plenty of popular Christian artists who have redone hymns. The problem is that they, well, I don't know, and it's not really a problem in and of itself, but it becomes a problem when I learn all of those and I think of Charlie Hall versions of hymns or Chris Tomlin versions of hymns, and then I go to lead them on Sunday and I realize that they've changed the time signature of the hymn. And when I lead my church in it, who's a traditional church who grew up singing out of the hymnal, and they're used to singing a song in 3-4, but I'm singing it in 4-4, four, four, they can't even sing along with me. So in a sense, you have a, a large changing of a song like that, or there might be a melody of a hymn that might have been improvised in the moment in the recording that I heard, the modern recording that I heard of a hymn, and I have that locked in my head now, and when I sing that part of the song, I sing it differently than my church, and we're no longer singing together in unison, but I'm going somewhere else, and I'm the one leading the song, so I confuse people. So I've actually had to follow this very direction recently because I need to sing them exactly as they are printed without altering them or mending them. It's not that it's bad to alter or mend them. It's that if my church knows how to sing a song a certain way, because they've grown up singing it, and I'm trying to lead them in it, then it's not their job to follow my way of singing the song. I need to learn how they sing the song, and I know that they grew up singing out of the hymnal. So I go to the hymnal, and I check the melody of every hymn that I've been doing lately because I'm like, I've gotten it wrong so many times, and it's so confusing because I'm the one who's supposed to be leading it. And so pay attention to that for your church. Are you singing the songs in the way that your church knows the songs or have you made up a new way to sing it? And sometimes it's not it's not the end of the world if you made up a new way to sing it, but if nobody's following along, then you don't try to drag people kicking and screaming into the new melody of the song. You submit to the way that the congregation is singing it because we want to lead them and it doesn't really matter if we go up a note at the end of the phrase or land down a note at the end of a phrase. It matters more so that we are singing it together. Direction number three, sing all. See that you join with the congregation as frequently as you can. Let not a slight degree of weakness or weariness hinder you. If it is a cross to you, take it up and you will find a blessing. What do I always say on this channel? I say, what is the purpose of us singing together? It is that we would be able to sing together at all times during the service, everybody singing together. And I've made videos on special music before. Special music is not singing all. It doesn't allow people the chance to do what was just talked about, to see that you join with the congregation as frequently as you can. And those aren't my complete thoughts on special music, but it just makes me wonder, did Wesley have special music in his church? I don't know. Uh, an interesting question to think about because I don't see how that direction with singing, see that you join with the congregation as frequently as you can. I don't see how that harmonizes with special music where we just sit and listen. But what is he communicating in that direction? It is that there is benefit in congregational singing for you, not just to sit there and listen, but to participate. I love how he says, if it is a cross to you, take it up 
and you will find a blessing. There's always those people in church who are like, I don't sing. I, I can't sing. I sound bad. I don't enjoy singing. Well, guess what? There are a lot of things in the Christian life that at first I do not enjoy. But when the Bible specifically tells us to sing, I mean, how many psalms could we point to? Psalm 147, praise the Lord for it is good to sing praises to our God for it is pleasant. A song of praise is fitting. Down to verse 7, sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Or Psalm 149, praise to the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song his praise in the assembly of the godly. Or Psalm 150, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heaven. How do we do it? Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I, I assume that the implication there is that we have breath so that we can verbally and melodically praise, praise God. I think Wesley was right to note that singing is not optional. There is, as the Psalm said, it is good to sing praise to God. Direction four, sing lustily and with good courage. Beware of singing as if you were half dead or half asleep, but lift up your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now, nor more ashamed of its being heard than when you sung the songs of Satan. Wow, I wonder how many people in our church love classic rock and will sing Highway to Hell by ACDC at the top of their lungs, but will not sing Amazing Grace at the top of their lungs. Sorry, I have to pick on the, the middle-aged dads of the congregation because I feel like oftentimes, uh, I'm sorry to say, but they're, they're guilty of just standing there and watching because they say they don't like singing, but they also like classic rock and will sing to ACDC and REO Speedwagon and so on and so forth. I'm sorry if that's you, but it's, it's just the case. Leslie is saying, be no more afraid of your voice now, nor more ashamed of its being heard than when you sung the songs of Satan. You used to sing the songs of Satan. You used to sing. I mean, how, how ridiculous is this? I, and I'm just, I'm just, I mean, I haven't observed this personally, but I'm sure that there's somebody in the church who will gladly sing, I'm on the highway to hell. I'm on the highway to hell. Right? Like, that is the, that's the song of Satan. You're singing, you're on the highway to hell. And you sing it because you like it, but you won't sing, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Why would we be ashamed to sing that? Just because we don't like the style of it, I guess. I don't know. Direction number five, sing modestly. Do not bawl so as to be heard above or distinct from the rest of the congregation, that you may not destroy the harmony, but strive to unite your voices together so as to make one clear, melodious sound. And all the worship leaders who have vocalists on their teams who don't know how to blend said, Amen. Don't bawl so as to be heard above or distinct from the rest of the congregation so that you may not destroy the harmony. And it's, I don't think he's talking about like harmony in singing vocally, but like the harmony, the unity of the gathering. Don't try to stand out whenever you are worshiping God. We are trying to be united as one corporate body, which now that I think about it, this goes back to worshiping together. And I always talk about on this channel, not having your own personal times of worship. If we were trying to have our own personal times of worship, then it would make sense to sing like that. We wanna be heartfelt and have our own personal expression above our preference of the corporate edification of the body. And so as worship leaders, maybe we need to think about that. Do I want my voice to be heard above the congregation? Because that's not, our, that's not really our responsibility. Sure, we're leading the song, and people might need to hear our voice above the congregation because they need something to follow, but how often do we love those moments where we step back and the congregation is virtually leading itself musically, and we just get to step back from the mic and they're all singing together? Like if I could have that moment all the time, every Sunday, that would be my preference. My church doesn't need to hear me. I'm up there to get the, the song started and if they're having trouble singing the song together, then I try to pull it back together. But, and, and this is convicting me right now because I'm like, man, maybe I just need to do that more. Like we want to lead our church well so that they can sing together, 
but sometimes our church just knows the song and it's not about my personal voice being heard above the congregation it is about the congregation's voice being heard as they teach and admonish one another direction six sing in time whatever time is sung be sure to keep with it don't run before nor stay behind it, but attend closely to the leading voices and move therewith as exactly as you can. And take care you sing not too slow. This drawling way naturally steals on all who are lazy, and it is high time to drive it out from among us and sing all our tunes just as quick as we did at first. I had to look up the, the historical context of this direction because I don't think that Wesley is saying don't ever sing slow songs. He's pointing out that at the time that there was a movement in the church, I think they got rid of like song leaders in the church. And so the church was having trouble keeping the tempo together. And so their, their singing became boring and monotonous and it just kept slowing down further and further and further. So now that I think about it, maybe I do need to, to lead my church intentionally in some form, but the church was just drawing on. And that's the, that's the natural tendency in worship, isn't it? That we slow down. I guess sometimes we speed up nowadays because we've got the drums going and whatnot but vocally we slow down and it just became so slow and monotonous that he was like sing it at the pace that it was written at get your tempo under control i don't know if there's more to it than that because i don't think he's ripping on slow songs and direction number seven above all sing spiritually have an eye to god in every word you sing aim at pleasing him more than pleasing yourself or any other creature. In order to this, attend strictly to the sense of what you sing, and see that your heart is not carried away with the sound, but be offered to God continually. So shall your singing be such as the Lord will approve of here and reward when he cometh in the clouds of heaven. And what a great reminder to lead into the hymnal. We can do all of the things that we just talked about, but if we do not sing spiritually, we must worship in spirit and in truth. If we don't worship spiritually, then it's all for naught. You've done all of the singing perfectly for nothing. If you have not treasured God in your hearts and only focused on the external things, then you have not truly worshiped. What a great reminder for us. And if you want help leading your church in spiritual worship, one of the best ways to do it is to constantly point to the Word of God. And that's why I put together a free PDF called Five Worship Speaking Transitions. You can use this Sunday in that free PDF. I will give you five word-for-word -word speaking transitions that are based on Scripture that will point people to spiritual truths so that they treasure God in their hearts above all things. And then that spiritual act overflows into external acts of glorification. So if you're interested in that, check that out down in the description below. Other than that, thanks so much for joining me. Till I see you in the next video, keep leading worship well.